much, much heavier. And the reason is that the reason for that is that they may have the same volume, but the mass per unit volume is different. All right. Um, so we need to define a quantity to uh, distinguish the difference between fluids, and um, we define something called the density. This is not this is not the letter P, right? This is the Greek letter rho, and is generally used to refer uh, or to uh, refer to mass density. And we define that as the mass of a body divided by its volume. In this case, the mass of a fluid uh, divided by the volume that it occupies. Now, since density is defined as a mass divided by a volume, its standard unit is going to be the standard units of mass divided by standard units of volume, uh, which is just going to be kilograms per meters cubed. And, uh, however, that's a unit that we rarely use in everyday life. All right. Uh, a more common unit is grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, and there's very simple conversion between the two. Uh, one gram per cubic centimeter is just equal to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. But uh, in usual, you know, the, in the calculations that we do, we, we will generally be using the standard unit uh, for the, uh, uh, the standard units for the density of water. This actually happens to be the density of water. Uh, one gram per cubic centimeter per gallon. Um, so if the density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter, what is the mass of one cubic centimeter of water? Oh, okay. Right, just one gram, right? That was an easy one. That's just to get you warmed up. Uh, we need to start out slow here because I know you're probably still on Christmas break a little bit. I certainly am. Uh, what would be the mass of two cubic centimeters of water? What was that? Two grams of Oh, well, um, if we have twice the volume, are we going to have twice? If we have twice the volume, are we going to have twice the mass or one half the mass? Twice. <laughs> Yeah, if we solve this for mass, this is going to be rho times v. So the uh, mass and the volume are directly proportional. That means that if you keep the density constant and double the volume, you're going to double the mass. So uh, two cubic centimeters of water would have a mass of two grams. Uh, three cubic centimeters of water would have a mass of three grams, and so on and so forth. So that's what we mean by mass per unit volume. We, we, need, we need the mass for every unit of volume that you uh, have in the system. Uh, all right. So those of you who had me in previous semesters know that I'm big on ratio reasoning problems. And here's an example of a ratio reasoning problem involving density. Uh, those of you who haven't had me in, in, uh, as a, an instructor before, or haven't had me recently as an instructor, uh, may not know my current method for teaching uh, ratio reasoning problems. So uh, let me go ahead and go through the entire process uh, of how I advise people to solve a problem like this. Okay. I really hate this whiteboard because it's not anchored to the wall. So I'm going to use the uh, I'm going to use the docking camera today. I'm going to use a pocket and uh, a regular old pen. Everybody see that all right? I wish I could turn up the light a little bit more. It seems kind of dim. But uh, this is the first time I'm doing this. This is my first test, so. I guess that's as good as it gets. Uh, I wonder, let me try something. OK, 
okay? So we all know what the relevant equation is, right? We all we only have one equation at this point during this semester. Uh, it's just going to be rho is equal to uh, the mass divided by the volume. Uh, however, we want to tweak this a little bit, uh, specialize it to the case of a cubic box. Um, and let's call the length of each edge of the box L. So if it's cubic and it has an edge length L, what will be the volume of the box? Yes, it's L cubed. All right. So let's replace this by M divided by L cubed. Um, okay. So at this point, the next step is to solve for the quantity you need the change in. I know that's bad English, but uh, we are trying to find the factor by which what quantity changes. Yeah, it's the density, right? Okay, so that's already done. Let's just write done. Okay. Uh, the next thing we want to do is set up a table of the quantities in the, on the right hand side of the equation and the factors by which they change. At any point you can't see what I'm writing, please let me know immediately. Um, but there are only two quantities on the right hand side. Uh, let me go ahead and write this up here. Okay, we have our table of quantities and factors. And there are only two, M and L. So as we contract the box so that uh, each of it, so that its edge length gets cut in half, by what factor does the mass of the gas change? Does it change? Yeah, no, it doesn't. No, no gas is leaking out of the box. No gas is being pumped into the box. Uh, the gas is just getting compressed, it's just taking up less space. So since the mass does not change in this process, we say that it changes by a factor of one. And uh, it should be fairly clear to everybody. Well, I don't know, this is the first day of the semester after Christmas break, so maybe I should just make sure and uh, ask whether you know the factor by which the edge length changes here. Oh, yes, yes is not really the answer I'm looking for. I was actually looking for that. Okay. Yeah, I understand, guys. I totally understand. This is uh, it's probably not a good morning. But uh, we know that each of its edges is only half as long as before, so L is going to change by a factor of one half. All right, so now, finally, in our last step, we rewrite the right side of the equation. Uh, substituting factors for quantities. All right, so I am going to take this, bring it down here, 
the M is going to get replaced by a 1. And the L is going to get replaced by a 1 half. And since the L is, square, uh, since the L is cubed, I'm also going to cube the 1 half. And so what is 1 divided by the cube of 1 half? Anybody brave enough to say, but to say it out loud? Okay. One over one eighth. Uh, right, it's eight. Okay, this is uh, this is the same thing as two cubed or eight. All right. So is is eight the new density of the gas? No. Well, what is the new density of the gas? One eighth. Yeah, it's 8 times the original density. The original density is given as rho, so we can say that the new density the new density is uh, 8 times rho. So, did anybody not get the attendance sheet? Okay. Uh, all right. So, to many of you, this looks very familiar. To others, it may not. I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page at the beginning of the semester. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions about what we did here? Uh, this may seem a little bizarre to people who haven't seen it before, uh, and it's act, I, I actually think it's kind of bizarre myself, but this is the only way I've found uh, to teach ratio reasoning. Uh, every other way I've tried to teach it, the students just don't get it. So, there you go. That was our... Um, conceptual problem, or ratio reasoning problem with density, now we want one that is a bit more quantitative. All right, here we have a large bowl containing 10 kilograms of water. We want to know what volume of alcohol we have to add. produce a uh, fluid with a given average density. All right, alcohol is less dense than water. Uh, so if you mix the two together, you're going to end up with a solution that is somewhat less dense than water. Uh, and in this case, it's gonna be 950 kilograms per meter cubed. So, um, once again, we start out with the uh, formula for density, except that we're talking about an average density here. Okay, this is the density of the, uh, the, the two fluids mixed together. And it's going to be the total mass of both together divided by the total volume of both fluids we're, we're mixing together. Uh, the total mass is going to be the mass of the water plus the mass of the alcohol. And the total volume, of course, is going to be the volume of the water plus the volume of the alcohol. So, uh, what we need to figure out here is uh, what are we given? Okay, this row right here is the uh, It's the um, <clears throat> this row is the density of the alcohol. All right. 
So we know, let's write down the stuff that we know. We know that the density of the alcohol is 790 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, what else are we given in the problem? Okay, 10 kilograms of water. So what do we want? Which variable represents that? Okay. It's just V sub W, right? So V sub W is going to be, or I'm sorry, wait a minute. Am I, uh, okay. See, like I said, I'm a little bit on vacation still too. No, uh, 10 kilograms is the mass of the water. Um, and we're given the average density. All right. So uh, that is rho average in this equation. That is given by 790 kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, is there anything else that we know? Oh, right, yeah. Nine, this is 950, okay. Right, it's rho average, it's 950. The uh, alcohol is, is 790. Okay. So, hopefully I'm warmed up now. And uh, is there anything else that we know that's relevant to this problem? Any other number? Quantity. Well, what about the density of water? Okay, yeah, well, it's one gram per cubic centimeter, which is the same thing as a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. All right, so the density of the water, rho sub w, is equal to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so we already know we already know the mass of the water. We already know the um, we already know rho average, right? Um, Everything else we either need to find or express in terms of something else. So, how can we get the, uh, or, or how should we express the mass of the alcohol? I mean, M sub A isn't going to do us any good because we're not given that, we're not trying to find it. How can we express it in terms of something that we're either given or know how to find, or, or need to find, I mean? Well, M sub A, the mass of the alcohol, is going to be equal to the uh, mass per unit volume of alcohol multiplied by the volume of alcohol. So uh, M sub A is just going to be rho sub A times V sub A. We know rho sub A, and we're trying to find V sub A. So uh, it's much more useful to make that substitution. Now, what about the volume of water? We're not given the volume of water. Uh, how can we express it in terms of something we know or something we're trying to find? Well, here's our master equation, right? Rho is equal to M divided by V. 
Okay, if we know the volume, I mean, uh, if we want to find the volume of something, what is it in terms of the mass and the density? Okay, all uh, right. All we have to do is switch these two. Okay, switch the row and the V, and we end up with V sub W is equal to M sub uh, w divided by rho sub w. Okay. All right, so we know the mass of the water and we know the density of water. So we can calculate this right away. And I know how much you guys love to plug numbers into things, so let's just go to town. Well, we're going down tomorrow. Whoops, they're only 10 kilograms of water. Okay, now I'm really warmed up. We've got a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. And so when we divide 10 by a thousand, we're going to get 100, right? Uh, let's see. I should express that in uh, three significant figures. So the volume of the water is a hundredth of a meter cubed. Uh, so now let's go ahead and uh, re-express this equation. So let's make this substitution. We end up with rho average is equal to the mass of the water plus the density of alcohol times the volume of alcohol divided by the volume of water, which we now know, plus the volume of alcohol. So at this point, we have to solve for the volume of, um, of alcohol. And it appears twice in the equation. Now, this is the point where uh, students have a tendency to panic, uh, even more than on a ratio reasoning problem. What's the first thing that we should do in order to solve for V, uh, V sub A, that is? Well, first thing that we want to do is multiply both sides by uh, V sub M plus V sub A in order to get V sub A out of the denominator, right? Uh, we don't like V sub A in the denominator. So we're going to multiply both sides by V sub M plus V sub A. What that's going to give us is rho average. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, VW. I don't know how I got an M out of that. Yeah, I mean, really, I think that uh, the Texas legislature should pass a law against teaching physics at 8 o'clock in the morning. Because <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that's just like the ultimate recipe for sleep deprivation, and you really can't do physics when your sleep is right. Uh, But I don't know. Write your representative or whatever. Uh, so this should also be VW plus VA. And uh, so now it becomes uh, row average times VW plus row average times VA is equal to MW plus rho A, V A. Um, now, V sub A still appears twice, but at least it's in the denominator both times. Okay, so that's an improvement. Uh, now, in order to, uh, on, in our next step towards making it appear just once in the equation, we want to take all the V sub A terms and put them on the same side, on the left, let's say. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going 
going to take this and put it over here. And I'm going to take this and put it over here. All right. So what that looks like is rho average times V sub A minus rho average times I mean, right, minus rho A times V A is equal to M W minus rho average uh, times V W. That should be a V. Okay, V W. Let's try to cover that up. Well, I can't make it look right. See, I should probably be doing this in pencil, but this thing is so dim it won't show up very well. Uh, okay. But I'm kind of dim this morning too, so I shouldn't be very uh, Finally, we can get V sub A to appear once by factoring it out on the left hand side. So. This will be equal to V sub A times rho average minus rho A is equal to MW minus rho average times VW. And then finally, we get our expression for V sub A by simply dividing both sides by the difference between the average density and the density of the alcohol. V sub A is equal to MW minus rho average times V sub M. Uh, did I do the W to M thing again? Why do I keep doing that? Okay. Uh, and this is rho average minus rho sub A. So your mass of water is 10 kilograms. Uh, average density, 950. Times the volume of water which we determined to be 0 0.0100 meters cubed, all divided by the difference between the average density and the density of the alcohol, uh, which is gonna be nine hundred and fifty kilograms per meter cubed minus 790 kilograms per meter cubed. So uh, that will ultimately give us a volume of 0 0.0031 meter cubic meters of alcohol. I kind of feel like that's what I drank just before coming to class. Same. All right. So that was a little messy algebraically. But, you know, I'm trying to stretch you here, get you back into the groove. Uh, don't forget to ask questions whenever they pop in your head. At this point, Maybe when let's move from possible. density to pressure. Or something. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, first of all, what is pressure? Uh, so those of you who have the last semester know all about what pressure is. This also good for you. But for those of you who didn't have the last semester, let's define it. Uh, first of all, 
Uh, let's say that we have two slabs of concrete that we're putting on a soft mat of some kind. We lay one of the slabs of concrete face down on the mat, and the other one we set uh, on its edge. All right. This is the one laid face down. This is the one that's set on its edge. And we notice, strangely enough, that the one that's lay, lying face down is hardly compressing the mat at all, while the one that's standing on its edge is uh, really making an impression. Hmm. All right. So why is it that this one makes more of an impression on the mat than this one? Is, is this one exerting more force on the mat? It's the same force, but in a different area. Smaller. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's it's not exerting more force, right? Because it has the same weight. These are two identical concrete slabs. Just different area. Uh, they both have the same weight, and so they're both exerting the same force downward on the mat. The forces are the same. Uh, the reason that this one makes a uh, deeper impression with the same force is because it, that same force is exerted over a smaller area. So we need a quantity that will um, uh, distinguish between these two situations. Uh, a quantity which is the force divided by the area. All right, the smaller the area over which a force is exerted, the more pressure it exerts. And uh, so since we define pressure as force per unit area, it's going to have standard units of, uh, well, standard force units divided by standard area units, or newtons per meter squared. And we give that the uh, special name Pascal uh, for some physics guy who worked on gases. Uh, so, Anyway, in order to find the pressure that this one exerts, we take the total weight and divide it by the area of a face. Actually, my own uh, to find the pressure exerted by this one on the map, we take the total weight and divide it by the area of one edge of the block. And of course, we get a larger answer here if the area is smaller. Now, uh, pressure is extremely important so when it comes to fluids. Uh, especially body fluids like blood, okay? You don't want the blood pressure to be too high. Um, it's a little damage to walls, your arteries, or some such thing. I'm not a biologist. I just don't like that kind of thing. Do we? But, uh, but anyway, uh, we know that fluids exert uh, forces on the walls of their container. Um, they exert pressure, and if we uh, consider a particular uh, cylindrical container with a fluid in it, a particular depth, uh, and look at two patches of equal surface area on the wall of that container, we're going to find that uh, if those two patches have equal area, the force on this patch is going to be larger than the force on that patch. Um, because the pressure is larger down here than it is up here. And if the pressure is larger but the area is the same, then pressure times area is going to be larger uh, down near the bottom. All right, so if we puncture this container at two different depths, we're going to find that the water squirts out faster down here than it does up here. All right, because the pressure that is forcing it out of the vessel is larger near the bottom. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that the fluid is not only exerting a pressure on the walls of the container, it's also exerting uh, you know, all the parts of the fluid, all the tiny parcels of fluid inside the container are exerting uh, pressures on each other. All right, so the pressure is essentially constant throughout this uh, connected body of the fluid. Now, how do we go about measuring the pressure of a fluid? Uh, you know, this is not how it's actually done in practice, but if we just
just imagine uh, an idealized way of how we would go about it. Uh, the first thing we want to do is take a cylinder with one end open and evacuate it. That is, pump out all the all the air. So it's a perfect vacuum. And then we're going to stick a spring in there. All right, a spring, uh, and then we're going to take a disc and push it down into the cylinder uh, and attach it to the end of the spring. This is called a piston. All right, it's free to slide in and out of the cylindrical vessel. And the further in we push it, the more the spring is contracted and the more it pushes back, okay? Um, so the, um, what we do is we take this uh, evacuated cylinder with the spring and the piston in it and we submerge it in our fluid and the fluid is going to press on the piston. As it presses the piston down into the, the cylinder, um, the spring is going to compress more and more. And it's, it, it, uh, at some point, it's going to be so compressed that the force that it exerts back on the piston is equal and opposite to the force that the fluid is exerting. And then we can measure that force from the contraction of the spring, or from the compression of the spring, uh, and divide that force by the area of the piston, and that's the pressure of the fluid at that point. Um, so let's say that we made a bunch of these tiny pressure measuring apparatus. apparatus What's the plural of apparatus? I think it's apparati. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so let's say we take uh, several versions of this thingy do and place it at various locations inside the fluid. Uh, orient it in various different orientations. Uh, what we'll find is that no matter what orientation the uh, thing we do has at a given depth below the surface of the fluid, uh, the spring will be equally compressed. All right? So the pressure is going to be the same in all directions. Uh, the second thing we'll notice is that uh, the deeper down we go into the fluid, the more the spring, uh, the more compressed the spring is because the pressure, the, the uh, fluid is exerting a larger force on the piston since the pressure is uh, larger down there. All right. Um, now, this is for a liquid. Uh, if there were a gas in here, uh, then, of course, the pressure would be at roughly the same in all locations. But for something like water, the depth is going to increase, or the uh, pressure is going to increase as we get deeper down uh, below the surface. So let's say that we want to come up with an equation that will tell us precisely what the pressure is at a particular depth below the surface of the fluid. Uh, we're going to assume in our derivation that the fluid is at rest. Okay, nobody's swirling it around. Okay, nobody's mixing it up. Uh, it's not, you know, circulating vertically like this because it's on the stove or something. Um, we assume that all tiny parcels of the fluid are not moving. So what we're going to do is we're going to, in our minds, this is a thought experiment, it's an imagination thing, let's play pretend. In our minds, we're isolating a cylinder of fluid. We're going to call it a plug, because that's just kind of a cool thing to call it. The plug will have a height D, and the top of the plug will be at the surface. It's in contact with the air. Uh, the bottom of the plug will be at the depth where we're trying to calculate the pressure. And the diameter of the plug is totally irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Okay? Uh, the forces that are pushing in from the sides all cancel each other out. Right? They all balance each other out. Uh, but the force that's pressing upward on the plug from below at the bottom is going to be larger than the force that's pressing down on the plug from the top. 
okay? The air is pressing down on the top of the plug, trying to make it sink. But the fluid is pressing upward on the bottom of the plug, trying to make it rise. And if we assume that the fluid is not moving, that was our assumption, then the two forces have to be balanced uh, so that the plug cannot accelerate upward or downward. Um, so uh, if, um, let's see. well, actually, I, I misspoke. It's not these two forces that balance each other. Uh, this force is equal to this force, the force of the air pressing down, plus the weight of the plug, all right? Because uh, we actually have two forces pushing down and only one force pushing up. That means that the force at the bottom, P times A, is going to be equal to the force pressing down on the top, P sub naught, the, the atmospheric pressure multiplied by the uh, area of the plug, plus M times G, the weight of the plug. Uh, the mass can be expressed as the density times the volume. The volume can be expressed as the, uh, the cross-section area times the height of the plug, D. And then all we have to do is cancel the area out. And we end up with the pressure down here being equal to the pressure up here, plus uh, the density of the fluid times G times the uh, depth below the, sur uh, the, the fluid uh, surface, all right? So if the surface is exposed to the air at sea level, then the pressure of the atmosphere down on it is uh, what we call one atmosphere, all right? That is uh, about 100 and, uh, well, it's 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Uh, and if you want it in yucky British units, it's, uh, 14.7 pounds per square inch. So that means that the uh, atmosphere is pressing on your skin, every square inch of your skin with a total force of 14.7 pounds, which is uh, why you feel kind of down this morning. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the study of physics today in the morning. It's, it's the pressure of the atmosphere. So let's imagine that we have a uh, tube, okay, here is a, uh, well, actually I wouldn't say it's a, it's a tube, it's sort of like a, a rectangular container, and we're filling it up, and this uh, container has various different uh, tubes coming out of the top of it. As we fill it with fluid, the fluid is going to rise in each of these three tubes. And the question is, uh, into which of the tubes does it rise the highest or the lowest? Does anybody have an opinion on this? Okay. Well, I have one, one, one vote for them uh, being all the same. Okay. Is that another vote for them? Okay. Uh, how many people think it's going to be the same for all of them? Okay. How many people think it's going to rise highest in A? Highest in B? Highest in C? Okay. So, I have uh, two votes for C. Maybe out nine votes for A, or nine votes for they they're all the same, and then everybody else just doesn't know or doesn't care. Or possibly both. Uh, actually, they do have to uh, all rise to the same height, okay? Because if they rose to different heights, let's say that uh, C was the highest, and B was lower, what would happen? What would be the difference? I mean, uh, would the pressure down here be the same or different? Different. Yeah, they'd be different. If you had a higher pressure here than you had here, what would happen? Yeah, water is going to flow from here to here and then rise into this tube. Okay, so yeah, if the, there were different heights of the fluid in the different tubes, there would be a pressure difference that would drive a flow 
of the fluid from one tube to the other. So that's all we have time for today.